basically the plan tonight is to discuss the two most common seasonal respiratory diseases in dogs, namely BOAS and laryngeal paralysis. It's supposed to be British summertime and we're pretty much inundated with these cases and shall be for the next few months. So I thought the best place to start is actually with BOAS. Unfortunately, these dogs are becoming more and more prevalent. Um, um, the likeness of these dogs to to owners is becoming bigger and bigger and we're almost seeing these, these breeds on a daily basis. And unfortunately, we're actually seeing this condition in dogs less than six months of age now. So if we look at the pathophysiology, this is a man-made problem. We have created these dogs like this. We have bred them to have a shortening of the skull um, and this has led to a whole lot of conformational defects. This combination of defects will result in an increased resistance to the airflow an increase in respiratory effort and increased negative pressure in the upper respiratory tract. So with a combination of the defects, they can be combined or divided into what we call primary defects or secondary defects. Primary defects normally consist of stenotic nares, the soft palate abnormalities, a hyperplastic trachea and ab aberrant turbinates, whereas the secondary defects is actually laryngeal collapse. So if we look at stenotic nares, um, it's reported that 43 to 85% of BOAS dogs have these. In my opinion, 100% of them do. Um, and basically all it is, is a, a medial deviation of the dorsal lateral nasal cartilage and it deviates medially. Now, a couple of years ago, there was a paper that actually had a very sophisticated grading system for these guys and basically graded them as mildly stenotic, moderately stenotic and severely stenotic. It doesn't really change our treatment plan. So in a normal dog, the soft palate should actually just brush the tip of the epiglottis. Um, and we're seeing probably over 85% of BOAS cases actually having an elongation and thickening of this soft palate. This thickened because of the constant vibrations between the epiglottis and the soft palate. That leads to trauma, inflammation and edema. And this thickening tends to be progressive. About 40% of BOAS dogs actually have concurrent hyperplastic trachea. Um, what's interesting to know is that there's actually reference values in the literature that actually measure the diameter of the um, trachea of the thoracic inlet compared to the diameter of a thoracic inlet. And if you can see um, over here, you can see what the difference is in, different, in the different breeds. A bulldog is definitely going to be more likely to have a hyperplastic trachea. Redundant pharyngeal folds of the loose mucosal folds at the base of the tongue. In my experience, whilst those reported as a primary defect, it's not something that plays a massive role in BOAS cases. But what's becoming more and more common is the documentation of abnormal nasal or nasopharyngeal turbinates. And these can either be hyperplastic, dysplastic, or aberrant. If they're in a rostral nasal canal, they're called rats. If they're in a corridor, they're called cats. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is a, both of these are retrograde scopes of the, the back of the nasal cavity. And you can see these abnormal turbinates sitting in the nasal pharynx. Interesting to note that there's actually two papers in 2016 that reported that pugs are more prone to having abnormal turbinates. So pugs tend to have more bony abnormalities. Frenchies tend to have more soft tissue abnormalities. So these primary defects lead to a turbulent airflow and then excessive negative pressure, which then draws the rest of the airways medially and results in the secondary defects. So by far the most common secondary defect we see in about 60% of patients is eversion of the laryngeal saccules. They are seen as these whitish, bluish structures and they sit just cranial to the vocal cords. Um, and then edema will just actually significantly worsen um, any narrowing that's there. Tonsillar hypertrophy has been described as a secondary defect. Once again, in my experience, I'm not overly convinced that plays a huge role in BOAS dogs because I have yet to do a tonsillectomy to improve these cases. But by far the most important secondary um, condition or defect associated with BOAS is laryngeal collapse. And as you probably remember, there's actually three stages. So the first stage is the aversion of the laryngeal saccules. Um, the second stage is when a cuneiform process, which is a uh, most rostral process of the arytenoids um, collapses medially and then when a coniculate collapses medially that's the third stage. So don't forget these guys can have concurrent conditions as well as conditions that are due to the BOAS condition. So bulldogs are particularly known to have pulmonic stenosis so look for cardiac disease 
The increased work of breathing can cause pyrexia and pulmonary edema, which is not related to the heart, can be present. Now, we don't quite know why this occurs. We do know it's something to do with a difference in the pressures. Um, they can also present with aspiration pneumonia. They can have concurrent bronchial collapse and they can have um, hyperplastic tongues. But I guess the probably most common concurrent condition we see with BOS dogs is gastrointestinal disease. Up to 75% of these patients are affected by it and actually the owners aren't aware of that. And when you actually go and ask the owners and say, you know, does your dog regurgitate, does your dog vomit, they then start to think that yes, they are doing that and it is actually abnormal. So don't forget to ask the question. The abnormalities we can see is um, gastroesophageal reflux, hiatal hernia, um, inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract, hypertrophy of the pylorus, as well as esophageal deviation. What's interesting, we don't quite know what the cause is in animals, it's not being published, but the theory of man is with the increase in respiratory effort, you get increased pressure in the abdomen, there's a massive difference between the abdomen and the thorax pressure, and then what then happens is the um, gastroesophageal junction then goes through the, the hiatus. So the signs that owners tend to report include salivation, by far the most common is regurgitation and vomiting, and sometimes these dogs will gag. I guess the association is confirmed by the fact that actually if you correct a BOAS condition, the GI signs actually significantly improve. So if we look at the clinical signs, most dogs will present like this. It's typical noisy breathing. So the noisy breathing can be divided into a stertor, which is more of a low pitch noise, or a strider, which is a high pitch nose. And the importance of knowing that is a stator normally is from the nose or the uh, palate, whereas a strider is normally the larynx. So this was actually a six-year-old pug. How on earth <coughs> it managed to get to this stage without having surgery, I don't know, because I'll show you a stairway in a bit. So the other signs are inspiratory dyspnea. They can be cyanotic and even collapse. Um, they can be exercise intolerance. They can have sleep apnea. They can cough, gag, and also don't forget the GI signs. So there's no doubt this condition is worsened by excitement or stress, um, eating and drinking, and the high temperature, which is why we call it a seasonal disease. And obesity, so uh, the body condition score is definitely a significant risk factor for BOAS. So how do we diagnose this? You don't need to be a genius to do this diagnosis. You can actually hear them from the other side of the reception. But it is very important that you do um, some, well, for me, three important steps to make sure you're assessing these patients correctly. A proper physical exam. Now, you're trying to identify the primary and secondary defects. Not as easy as it sounds. The only sort of real defect you can see is the synotic nares in a conscious animal. Um, but you should be able to listen to and hear the difference between the stator and strider, get an idea of what the soft palate is like and what the larynx is like. Um, you also want to listen or try and pick up any concurrent diseases like pulmonary stenosis or aspiration pneumonia. Now, there's a recent paper, um, actually this year, by the Cambridge guys that have actually said that there's a three-minute trot test they do that actually increases sensitivity of picking up a laryngeal strider and thus um, picking up laryngeal collapse. So physical exam, visual examination of a larynx, and also diagnostic imaging. Now you can do bloods in these guys. Most of them are gonna be normal. Um, if you're really fancy, you can do blood gas analysis. Um, I don't tend to, to do those. So with regards to imaging, um, the, the basic is to do thoracic radiographs. Um, ideally free views, so right lateral, left lateral, and DV. Um, worst case scenario, do right lateral and DV. And what are you looking for? You're looking to see if there's, ever, if there's any underlying conditions um, that may need to be corrected preoperatively <coughs> or whether you actually have something that actually is going to affect your prognosis. So like a hyperplastic trachea. These dogs never do as well. Also aspiration pneumonia um, and obviously any sort of heart disease. So that top x-ray is, is a picture of a pulmonary stenosis. <coughs> it's very nice to have CT um, and not essential, but it does help us assess these patients more in a sense of we can look at their soft palate better, as well as particularly the turbinates. 
Now, what we're looking for is basically the length and the thickness of a soft palate. And you can see this is a Frenchie that um, there's in, in the tracheal tube. And you can see a soft palate is very long and almost twice the size of an ET tube. Okay. And knowing that may change the way you're going to manage this case. Bear in mind, I said to you earlier that um, pugs tended to have more bony changes, so their soft palate actually tends to be shorter and thinner. The other, the other purpose of doing CT is that you can actually identify the presence of any ab aberrant turbinates. Now, we'll talk in a bit about what the significance of that is and what we do about them. Um, but as I said, it's, it's a nice thing to have, but it's not essential in, in private practice. Certain cases may need uh, individual approaches, so you may need to be doing some cardiac evaluations um, and you may need to do endoscopy, so rhinoscopy as in anti-grade and retrograde. So this is the scope you saw earlier, which is showing you the aberrant turbinates in the, in the nasopharynx. You also may want to be doing an upper GI scope if you're worried about the GI signs. And some cases will need fluoroscopy, um, so we normally do that if there's a suspicion of hiatus hernia. I can't say I do this as a standard. These are only in cases that don't tend to respond and still have the GI signs post-operatively. It's quite easy to do, so I'm told by our medics. Um, basically, swallowing barium, and then you can see it go down into the um, esophagus, into the stomach, and coming back straight out. What's interesting to know is actually 45% of patients with BOAS have hiatus hernia, and the majority of those are actually Frenchies. So, the other important thing to do, as I said, was a uh, physical exam to do the um, visual exam of the larynx and the imaging. So this is the visual exam of the larynx. So what are you looking for? You're looking to see what the soft palate likes. So you're looking at the length, the thickness of a soft palate, and you also want to assess the larynx. Do you have a version of a saccule? Do you have laryngeal collapse? Um, and it's important that you actually look at the soft palate um, before you put the endotracheal tube down because of that is just going to disturb or displace the, the positioning of, a, of the epiglottis in a soft palate. Um, and also don't put any traction on the tongue when you're doing this because once again it's going to change the position. And likewise the head position. So I put the, get the nurses to put the dog in a normal sternal position and the head at a straight level direction to me. When you confirm the diagnosis we tend to take these guys straight to surgery. There's no point um, anaesthetizing them, making a diagnosis, and then saying, well, well, we'll cut it another day. They're at increased risk for post-operative problems if you do that. So this was the pug you saw earlier, um, just to sort of orientate you. Um, this is obviously looking inside his oral cavity. The top jaw is suspended by some umbilical tape. And what I'm trying to show here is that the actual the soft palate is completely sucked down the larynx, and you can actually see on the video what's happening when this dog inspires. Okay, we're videoing. It doesn't matter how many times I try and get a video with nobody talking, it never seems to happen. <laughs> Even when you say, please don't talk. <laughs> so when you actually then flip down the epiglottis in this dog, you can actually see the um, saccule sticking out there. So how do we manage these guys? They can present as a respiratory crisis, um, and this can actually be one of the most stressful things, especially in, in any practice um, in, in the middle of the day when you're trying to do 20 other thousand things. Um, but remember, there are trigger factors for this, so you know when these cases are going to start to becoming decompensated, so things like overexertion, the heat, stress, and obesity. And the reason why these trigger factors play a role is when a dog's becoming over hot or over exercising, they're going to pant more. The panting vein increases the turbulent airflow through the airways. This increases the negative pressure. The airways become even more narrow and it becomes a vicious cycle. Okay. So for me, it doesn't really matter what's causing that upper respiratory tract obstruction. There are sort of four key principles of managing this. So this will apply to a laryngeal paralysis dog as well. So you need to call these patients. They're pyrexic because they're working bloody hard to try and get air into those lungs, okay? Um, how, how to call them? You can use fans, you can use um, uh, towels which are in, with cold water, aircon, however, it doesn't really matter, okay? But unless you start to call these dogs, the vicious cycle is going to keep going. Sedation is a good thing to do. Um, you can give a low dose ACP or butorphanol. 
And obviously cortical steroids um, are very much indicated to reduce any sort of laryngeal edema. You also need to think about providing oxygen. You need to decide how you're going to do it. There's different ways, so you can use flow-by. For me, that's pretty ineffective. You can use a mask, which is better than flow-by, but then by putting a mask in front of a dog's face, which is having respiratory compromise, can be quite stressful. It can build up carbon dioxide in there and also can be quite hot for them. Um, you can use nasal cannulas or ideally if you have an oxygen tent. You need to decide what rate of oxygen you're going to use. There are um, particular reference ranges within the, uh, within the literature. Bear in mind that you can get oxygen toxicity. So this is when the inspired oxygenation is greater than 60% um, for a long period of time, especially 24 hours. And basically what happens is you get free radicals forming in the lung, which lead to inflammation, edema, and a much worse situation. If those four things don't work, you're going to have to consider a temporary tracheostomy tube. Now, there's no doubt this will increase your morbidity and increase the mortality of a patient, but it can actually be life-saving. It's not an undertaking you want to take with um, take easily because it does have severe repercussions of the management of this. To select a tube size, once again, there are reference ranges within the literature. Um, however, sort of a rule of thumb is 50% of the lumen diameter. The reason why we go for 50% is that if it gets obstructed, you can get air going around the tube, but it's also big enough for air to go through the tube. Now, there's cuffless and cuff tubes on the market. I tend to use a cuffless one. The problem with cuff tubes is two things. People may forget to uncuff them, so if there is a blockage, there's no escape route or no secondary bypass system for the air to go past. Not only that, the cuff itself can actually cause pressure necrosis. So the only time I would use that is if I'm trying to give an anesthetic via tracheostomy tube, which is not very often. You can have single cannulas or you can have double cannulas. Now the advantage of having a double cannula is they're a lot easier to clean, but the problem is the cannula itself is quite narrow. So I don't know how many of you have tried putting these in particularly these in bulldogs, and have them come out within half an hour. Um, unfortunately, bulldogs have very thick necks, and these tubes are not made for bulldogs, they're human tubes. So actually what people are starting to do now is doing their own DIY modification, I guess. Um, and basically what we take is a normal endotracheal tube, say a five millimeter one. We make two slits 180 degrees apart so when you slit it down you end up with two flaps coming out okay and then you can put your umbilical tape through those flaps um, and a lot of surgeons are now starting to use these for your bulldogs because they notoriously come out and they're a high management uh, management issue so how do we place them you can place them under local or you can do under GA. I personally prefer GA. I think it takes the stress out of the situation a lot better. You're getting an airway, so you're getting oxygen down there, and it's just a lot less stressful for, for whoever's placing it. It needs to be done aseptically. I put the dog obviously on their back, and I hyperextend the neck. The reason behind that is it then brings the track here up to the skin. You want to, um, as I said, do it as aseptically as you possibly can, even though you're in a rush. Um, in size, on the ventral midline, a couple of centimeters caudal to the larynx. You want to separate the muscles in the midline. Gelpies work really well for this. And then the aim is to incise between the fifth or the fourth and the fifth cartilage ring. Good luck on trying to find that in, when you're in a rush. Um, it's not that easy. As long as you're fairly proximal and a couple of centimeters behind the larynx, you should be absolutely fine. What you do need to remember is do not cut um, greater than 50% of the circumference. If you do, you're going to get evulsion of the trachea um, and then you've got a, a big problem on your hands. I advise putting stay sutures um, both above and below your tracheostomy site um, and you're going to use those to actually pull apart to get your tube in. Now, it's worthwhile making one longer than the other or labeling them because if you're having to replace the tube at any stage, you're not quite sure which side the um, suture's on, and so it's just easier to know which side to pull it away when you're, when you're all in a panic. So you can uh, normally use just the sutures to pull apart the, the tracheal rings to get a tube down, um, or worst case scenario, you can stick a hemostat on a proximal aspect to push it down to get your tube down. Uh, remove your endotracheal tube as you're putting this down. Um, you should not need any skin sutures unless you've been very adventurous with your skin incision and you've made it far too long. Um, and then just secure it with umbilical tape. 
So how do we manage these? These are probably one of the most frustrating things to try and manage. Um, they're high maintenance. You need to have round the clock supervision for this really. Um, you should not really need antibiotics or any um, si um, significant dressings. You also need to consider how these dogs are sleeping. A lot of them have a lot of loose folds, especially your bulldogs around, around the neck. And if they sleep with their heads and neck flexed, they're likely to obstruct it. In addition, excessive bedding, some dogs will ruffle their bedding up and obstruct it that way. So as I said, they do need to be monitored 24 seven. There's three, for me, three important things to how to manage a, tra a temporary tracheostomy tube. One is the area needs to be cleaned. We need to hydrate the airways and we also need to suction it. So we need to clean the surrounding areas. This will produce a huge amount of mucus. And the reason behind that is that the air that is being inhaled is cold and it's dry because it's bypassing the upper respiratory tract where it's normally warmed and humidified. Um, not only that, the actual tube itself will, will cause a lot of tracheitis. So you get this huge amount of mucus and discharge that comes out and accumulates around the skin. And if you're not careful, you'll end up with moist dermatitis. You just need to sort of clean it a couple of times a day. Um, some people put a leave-in like here, but obviously be careful you're not obstructing your, your airway. Um, so we said, we spoke about airway hydration. The importance of doing this is to actually reduce the mucus plugs that are formed. Um, now, we used to sort of think that sticking saline down there or nebulizing this actually broke down the, the bonds in the, the mucus, but actually it's now thought that the advantage of this is actually it causes them to cough and then they cough up any of the, the plugs. So the third part of maintaining this was suctioning the tube. So uh, this needs to be done aseptically. I have a dog sitting with a head and neck extended facing me. Um, and it's an ideal, it's ideal to pre and post oxygenate these guys. Um, suctioning the airways is gonna cause a degree of hypoxia. Use a sterile suction catheter, which is soft and pliable, and you shouldn't really insert it much further than where the um, tube ends. The only times I would suggest you put it any further is obviously under veterinary guidance and also if you're suspecting there's a much deeper plug, um, but you do carry huge risks of causing atelectasis. Um, the suctioning should be sort of 10 to 12 seconds at a time. Um, rotate the, the tube as you're doing it um, so you're not causing um, pressure necrosis or damage to one particular part of the tracheal wall and should be done every three or four hours or more regularly if required. So the two concerns when you're suctioning is, as I said, hypoxia, and the other thing you can cause is vagal response. So it's worthwhile having an ECG on these guys, and as I said, pre and post oxygenation. Coupage and gentle exercise will, will help as well. So when we come to remove it, um, fairly simple. You just need to occlude it for 15 to 20 minutes. Make sure you're watching that dog um, and ensure oxygen's available. We tend to just monitor the SpO2 respiratory rate and pattern of breathing and be prepared to re anaesthetize and replace. Most of them heal by second intention healing. If you start putting sutures in, you're going to end up with subcutaneous emphysema um, and obviously clean the area a couple of days until it heals. Um, remember to warn the owner about avoiding swimming or bathing if they want a, a, a live dog. So. Um, Complications, up to 50%, as I said, this is a managemental nightmare, so you need to be using this in the right cases and almost as a last resort. Um, the most common complication is blocking of a tube with mucus, and that's more common in cats because uh, mucus is much thicker and uh, cat's tubes are much smaller. But the problem we tend to see in dogs is dislodgement of a tube, and the bulldogs, have, because of their thick necks, and as I said, try that modification of the ET tube. Um, the other Possibilities are subcutaneous emphysema, which can extend down into the chest cavity. They can cough and gag and end up coughing the tube out. And I guess a long-term complication is stenosis. Um, and this is basically um, due to where the stoma is, as well as where the tip of the, uh, tip of the um, tracheostomy tube is. Most of these have stenosis, but most of them are subclinical. You need to get over 60% of the airway narrowed before you start seeing clinical signs. So let's get back to specifically BOAS. So you can try conservative management. So what you're trying to do is actually eliminate the trigger or the predisposing factors. So weight loss, reduce the exercise and avoid high temperature. 
to me, there's no way you're going to get that dog to lose weight without exercising it. And it just becomes a cash 22. You can't exercise it. You can't lose weight. You're going to get more weight. Okay. So for me, conservative management is not really the way to go. Maybe that's just because I'm a surgeon. I don't know. But um, So if we look at stenotic nares, what we do with, well, what I particularly do with him, Bear in mind, 80% of the airflow obstruction is actually in the nostril. So if you do a good job on this, you've got a lot of a battle one. I tend to position these guys in sternal recumity, um, the chin on a sandbag, um, and make sure that the nose is level facing you. Um, it's very important to try and get this symmetrical. This is what the owner's going to see. They're not going to see what you do in the larynx, but they're going to see what the nares look like afterwards. Now, there's different ways of doing a neuroplasty. Um, most people and me tend to do a vertical wedge. So basically what we're aiming to do is remove a wedge of tissue from the dorsal lateral nasal cartilage. What's very important and a mistake a lot of people make is not extending it far enough cordially. You need to hit the LR fold, which is the sort of the bulbous protuberance of the ventral nasal concave. Um, and to do that, you're almost going in, I guess, probably about a centimeter because that is where most of the instructions coming from. It will bleed, don't worry. As soon as you start putting stitches in there, it will stop. Um, and I just normally put a few simple interrupted sutures in. So this was a case recently done. So I tend to use a number 11 blade and I tend to start on the medial aspect of the uh, wedge first, just to make sure that I've left enough tissue to suture. As I said, it does bleed. One way of stopping the bleeding is also putting uh, sterile cotton buds up his nose as well. That tends to work quite well. And when I start suturing, I suture from the bottom first. The reason behind that is to make sure there's good alignment and cosmetically it looks better. So you can see the before, the before and the after. So what do we do with a soft palate? Um, for me, positioning these guys is key, and I actually tend to do this part of a procedure before I do the stenotic nares, because I know I can position this. Um, once again, sternal recumbency. The maxilla needs to be suspended from some sort of pole um, above or either side or above the, the dog's head. Um, and I tend to use a mouth gag, because it certainly does improve exposure. So a staphylectomy is really just a matter of shortening the soft palate. Um, we need to resect that to a certain level. Um, if we don't resect it enough, we're going to end up with no improvement. If we resect it too far, we're going to end up with aspiration pneumonia. Um, now, ideally, it should be no further than the caudal third of the tonsils, but sort of a, a good weight, a good line to go for is just aim for the caudal tonsils. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, I tend to put a stay suture on the sort of midline, most caudal aspect of a soft palate, and then I use that to pull it forward. Some people use Alish tissue forceps as well. And then I tend to take a pair of scissors um, and I cut a little bit, suture, the oral and nasal mucosa together, cut a bit, suture, and I suture in a continuous pattern. You can use um, scalpel blades, you can use laser, you can use the vessel sealing device. It doesn't really make much difference. Remember to keep checking the position of your cut um, because when you're obviously pulling the um, soft palate towards you, you're going to lose your bearings on how far you need to cut. So every now and again, release your tension and you can just see that you're cutting in a straight line. So the other technique is sort of, uh, I suppose it's been described the last few years as a folding flat platoplasty. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the whole idea of this was to actually um, not only shorten the soft palate, but actually to thin it out as well. Um, and sort of try and explain this to you. So the picture on the left is the uh, sagittal view of side view. And these are intraoral, obviously a schematic and, and in a live patient. So the black part is supposed to be the soft palate. So what you need to do is you need to get um, stay sutures on both sides of the soft palate, the most caudal aspects, and you're getting your system to, to pull it forward. You then need to incise this mucosa in sort of a square or trape trapezoid shape. And you want to then remove the tissue between the oral mucosa and the nasal mucosa. Okay, so you can see on the picture on the left how it's actually now much thinner. And if you then go and suture that to that, you've shortened it as well. You need monopolar cautery to do this. 
So what do we do with the averted laryngeal saccules? Who knows? Um, there is still huge controversy as to whether it improves outcome. A study a couple of years said that dogs which had a sacculectomy um, had a higher risk of moderate and severe complications post-op. What we what was not apparent in that paper is were these dogs more severely affected in the first place? We don't know. Okay. Um, some, some surgeons will say this is a secondary defect and therefore if you treat the primary it will resolve. However, I've yet to see spontaneous regression of, of these saccules. I went through a stage when I didn't, I went through a stage when I did and I currently still do now remove them. The biggest worry about removing them is what we call laryngeal webbing. So we can get scar tissue, especially eventually, that can result in stenosis later on in life. To actually remove them is very, very simple. You just need to grab one, uh, either with some long debeckies or Alice tissue forceps, and you just basically trim them off at the base. If they bleed, you can just put a pressure on. You don't need to do anything more than that. So we mentioned earlier about the abnormal aberrant turbinates. Uh, we know these have been documented more and more and a lot of people are getting very excited about it. Um, and they're talking about um, the use of late or laser assisted turbinectomy. Now that's widely used in humans, but actually there's very, very few studies in dogs that have shown that this of any of huge benefit. There's a couple of papers in the last, what, three years? Um, Two papers by the Octoring guys uh, where they actually described this laser assisted turbinectomy in 160 odd dogs. They removed all the aberrant turbinates. 33% have had intraoperative hemorrhage. Um, but within six months, a lot of them have regrown. And likewise, um, the paper in 2019 also only had a six month follow up. Um, but what they were saying that dogs which had normal um, conventional treatment of the upper airways for BOAS. If they had a lot of soft tissue in the coronal region, as in aberrant, soft aberrant um, turbinates, then they were more likely to need a laser treatment. I think the jury's out as far as I'm concerned. Yes, people are getting excited about it, but there's no long-term evidence to say this is what the thing to do or not. You can see the, the aim of it is, so this is a pre-op, this is where all the turbinates are, you can see the aberrant turbinates there, and the whole idea is just to ablate all of that. So. When you start getting stage two and stage three laryngeal collapse, that's when things get a little bit more tricky. Um, now, this is a secondary condition. Um, therefore, some people say if you correct the primary defects, a lot of these dogs can cope. If they don't, you can consider doing a, a tie back. Um, although there's no studies in the veterinary literature to say that that's actually successful or not with laryngeal collapse. Um, or worst case scenario, permanent tracheostomy tube. So post-operatively, um, basically I would suggest extubating these as, as late as possible um, with the cuffs, cuffs slightly inflated. You will get a bit of blood in the upper airways, so it helps remove that. But bear in mind, these guys can undergo upper respiratory tract obstruction within, within hours. Um, so you always need to be ready to re-intubate these guys or do a tracheostomy tube. Um, oxygenation available um, and avoid stress. The interesting thing is, I um, don't need to tell you about analgesia, but medication for GI signs, a lot of these guys will need a short course of, of um, whether it be prokinetics, antiemetics, or anti-reflux. But actually there's some evidence coming out that the use of um, omeprazole preoperatively will actually reduce regurgitation and vomiting and hence aspiration pneumonia. So I tend to now, with dogs which have got um, severe GI signs, tend to send them home on five days of omeprazole and then tell them to come in for their surgery. So complications, as I just sort of alluded to, you can get upper respiratory tract obstruction. That can be within the immediate period or within 24 hours. Uh, you can also get aspiration pneumonia. So this was a bulldog I did well, maybe eight months ago. So this was pre-op. Um, see, lung feels nice and clear. This is 24 hours. This dog um, had regurgitated all night long and ended up with huge aspiration pneumonia. You can see the entire uh, consolidation of the cranial lung lobe. We unfortunately <laughs> lost that dog. Other complications are persistent coughing, gagging, strider and stertor, and as I said to you about laryngeal webbing. So I don't know how many of you guys have heard about this epiglottic retroversion? No? Okay, so one of the possibilities for persistent signs over BOAS is this, and basically this is a matter of that the epiglottis gets flipped back up and stuck within the larynx and the, the upper airways.
Now, the higher epiglottis muscle, which is the muscle under here, is supposed to um, sort of depress or bring eventually retract the epiglottis. And if we have any nerve damage to that, for whatever reason, this is just flipping back during inspiration. Um, I've seen that in a few cavies, um, so it definitely it does occur, and it's worthwhile just bearing that in mind when these guys are still sounding like Boas dogs after the surgery. And the only thing you can do with these guys is either do uh, epiglottopexy, where you suture the epiglottis to the base of the tongue, or you can do, which sounds very drastic, a subtotal excision of the epiglottis. So I've learned as, as I've gone through my residency and diploma that the more you read, the less you seem to know what is the prognosis for these guys? Um, I used to always believe that younger dogs with any stenotic nares and elongated soft palates did really, really well. 90% of them had good to excellent respiratory function. However, recent studies have shown that younger dogs with these signs have definitely a negative prognostic factor. And increasing age increases the severity of laryngeal collapse. So we win either way. Um, whether they're young, whether they're old, they're never going to be normal. Um, a normal body condition score with clinical signs is also a negative pro pro prognostic factor. And I think the reason behind that is if it's not obesity related, um, then it's not, you know, the obesity is not a risk factor if they're not fat, if that makes sense. So they obviously, airways must be pretty bad if they've got a normal body condition score and airways, uh, clinical signs. So for me, the, the big debate is laryngeal collapse. So what's the prognosis with these guys having stage one, stage two, stage three laryngeal collapse? And there's conflicting studies. We used to always think that um, <coughs> laryngeal collapse had a much poorer prognosis. However, interestingly, Hamel in 2015 found actually there was no correlation between the severity of laryngeal collapse and prognosis in 70 odd dogs. So my, my aim now, or what my belief is, I treat the primary defects, remove the saccules, and the majority of these dogs, even if they have stage two or stage three laryngeal collapse, seem to do fairly okay. I have yet to have to do a laryngeal tie back, and I've yet to ever have to do a permanent tracheostomy in these guys, okay. So before we whiz on to laryngeal paralysis, in summary, um, remember there are conformational differences within the breed. So pugs are definitely tend to have more bony abnormalities. Will, that, will this affect the way you're gonna manage them? Um, whereas Frenchies tend to have more soft tissue abnormalities. So maybe the Frenchies are better to have a folding flap palatoplasty versus a staphylectomy, but there's no studies to show that. Um, Surgical correction early before irreversible changes. I'm now seeing these guys at six months of age and I'm correcting their, their airways now. I do warn owners that as they get older, you may end up having to repeat some of the surgery. Diagnose and correct them as in do the surgery under one GA. You're certainly gonna avoid a lot of complications. And remember the gastrointestinal disease is common. It usually improves for following surgery. However, if it doesn't, it needs to be investigated and, and managed because you've got a dog which has got a compromised airway, which is regurgitating. It's, you know, you're gonna end up with aspiration pneumonia. There are actually six cartilages forming the larynx. As a surgeon, I'm only interested in four. So we have the epiglottic, uh, the white, we have the thyroid purple, and the cricoid, which is the green, and the arytenoid, which is the sort of yellowy color. So if we look at the epiglottic, that's the most rostral cartilage. Um, it tends to be sort of spade shaped, and it's supposed to just tip on the, ba um, on the back of a soft palate. The thyroid is, is by far the largest, so the purple one, um, and it uh, basically consists of two lamella, so two, body, uh, two walls left and the right. Um, and they're actually fused on the ventral aspect, but not on the dorsal aspect. As these um, lamella extend dorsally, they actually make or extend to a protuberance caudally called the caudal horn and then the cranial horn. And the important thing to know about these horns is between the horn and the lamella is a notch. And on the cranial notch is where your cranial laryngeal nerve and artery sit. So the cricoid, the green one, um, is a complete ring um, and it's actually connected to first tracheal ring. Now the important thing to know about this is there's actually two synovial articulations. So we have the, um, get this right now, the cricothyroid, okay, so between the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage, and the cricoarytenoid, so the cricoid cartilage, the green and the arytenoid, which is yellow. This is the important one to know about. This is where your 
Cricoarotenoidus dorsalis is inserted, and this is where you need to be looking at putting your suture. So the arotenoids in yellow are paired. There's one on the left, one on the right, and each has four processes. So we have a cuneiform process, which is the most rostral one, and it's sort of triangular. Um, the horn-shaped one, or the one that forms the majority of the, um, the laryngeal inlet, is called the coniculate. Um, and then the most caudal one is the muscular process, and that's the one that forms the cricoarotenoid. Oh, sorry, junction. Um, the other process is the vocal process, which sits at the bottom of the arotenoid, which just has the vocal ligament and muscle attached to. So, the muscles. There's in extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the larynx. Um, the extrinsic um, consists of basically the thyropharyngeus, which is the one in the middle, the um, hyopharyngeus, and the cricopharyngeus. This is the one of importance because you're going to incise through that one. They're supplied by the 9th and 10th cranial nerve, and basically the function of those is to constrict the pharynx. So it's important to know this because when we talk about the surgical technique in a few minutes, if you damage these um, muscles too much, you're going to end up with a poor motility of the pharynx, which can increase or predispose to aspiration pneumonia. So there's seven intrinsic muscles. I'm not going to name them all. But the only one of importance is the cricoarotenoid dorsalis, as that's the abductor. Now, they're all supplied uh, by the cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. And I'm sure you can remember back at university how the vagus nerve runs down the neck at the thoracic inlet, it shoots off and gives off a um, recurrent laryngeal nerve, which then goes back up the neck and the vagus carries on down the chest. Where that uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve ends is the caudal laryngeal nerve, and that is the main supply to all the muscles in the larynx except the cricothyroidus muscle. Okay. The cranial laryngeal nerve actually comes directly from the vagus, and that's just more of a, a sensory supply and motor supply to the cricothyroidus muscle. Okay. And these two, these two nerves are actually anastomose, but it's the caudal laryngeal nerve we're, we're uh, interested in. So, that's the anatomy done. So, laryngeal paralysis, what is it? It's as simple as the failure of the arotenoids to abduct during inspiration. And this can be either due to damage to the uh, vagus nerve or damage to that cricoarotenoidus dorsalis muscle. It can occur unilaterally or bilaterally. Now, um, if it's bilateral, that's when we tend to see clinical signs. However, unilateral laryngeal paralysis can show signs if they are under severe exertion or severe exercise. There's two forms. Um, there's the congenital form, and the more common form that we are so, uh, sort of more familiar, familiar with is um, the acquired form. So the congenital form normally occurs in dogs less than one year, um, and it tends to be hereditary. And there's certain breeds that are predisposed to this. So you have your Bouvier, your Husky, and your Rotti. Um, interestingly enough, which I'll show you a video of in a minute, um, we have recently, in my previous practice, recently uh, diagnosed this in a Springer Spaniel, so that's the first Springer Spaniel that's um, been diagnosed with it. And basically, it's a progressive degeneration of the laryngeal nerves. And I put other nerves there, which I'll talk to you about a little bit in a minute, because that's important to know. By far, the most common type is the acquired. Now, this tends to occur in uh, larger breeds. As they get older, you're typically your Labradors, your Retrievers, your Setters. Um, and there's a whole host of different causes for this. Um, so a mass or a tumour in the neck or the mediastinum can damage the, the vagus nerve or recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, you can get trauma. So if you end up doing a bilateral thyroidectomy um, and damaging both, both of the nerve supplies, you can end up with laryngeal paralysis. Um, you can get uh, polymyopathy, such as myasthenia gravis, hormonal problems, which I'll mention in a minute, but by far the most common is idiopathic. We just don't know what causes this. So it's now becoming more and more common belief that laryngeal paralysis is part of a generalized polyneuropathy. And whilst clinical signs of laryngeal paralysis are most common, this polyneuropathy can also affect the esophagus, so it can cause megaesophagus. It can also affect the ischiatic nerve, um, which can cause uh, hind limb weakness, lower motor, lower motor neuron deficits, and atrophy of the muscles, particularly the cranial tibialis. The ulnar nerve has been reported to be affected. However, um, I have yet to see that. Um, 
And it's interesting to know that these dogs come in, they may not show any limb weakness, but actually most of them will develop some sort of neuropathy in their hind limbs within a year. What's interesting to know that in 2016, there was a, a paper saying that if these dogs had concurrent neurological abnormalities, they're much more likely to have post-operative complications. I guess if you have a um, esophagus that's not functioning well, you're going to end up at much greater risk of uh, regurgitation, aspiration, pneumonia. So like our BOAS dogs, we do have concurrent conditions that we need to be aware of, so megaesophagus. 8% um, of these dogs can come in with aspiration pneumonia. Um, also, they can get pulmonary edema, non-heart related, and as I said, polyneuropathy. So, clinical signs. This is the Springer I was talking to you about. Most of them will present with an inspiratory strider. What's interesting to note in this dog, you can see if you have a dog running around, this dog hasn't had any exercise and the other dog is running around completely normal, so it just shows you how bad this dog is, okay. So you can typically hear the, um, the high pitch in that, in that noise, okay. Unfortunately, a lot of people just, uh, or a lot of owners seem to think this is just their dogs getting old um, because they become exercise intolerant. Um, they can also cough and gag. Um, you can get a change in their voice, dysphonia, um, you can get dysphagia, as I said, um, and once again, these can be pyrexic, same reason as the Boas dogs. So they can normally present as chronic, um, with chronic clinical signs, however they can, due to the same reasons as Boas dogs, present with an acute crisis, so stress, excitement, over-exercise, obesity, but once again, the weather. Um, but the condition tends to be progressive and is slowly progressive over months and years. Um, and as I said, to normally to show clinical signs, it has to be bilateral. So how do I diagnose this? So clinical exam is important. Um, you will get referred sounds or upper airway sounds hearing in the chest, and they can mask aspiration pneumonia. They can often be pyrexic and they can end up with heat stroke. And also remember polyneuropathy, you know, try and do a basic neuro exam um, if that's possible. We always tend to do bloods on them, mainly because they're geriatrics, we'll do a haematology and biochem. Now, thyroid or hyperthyroidism has been reported as a complication or been associated with um, laryngeal paralysis. And I suppose if you're suspecting that, you can do a thyroid panel. However, the association between hyperthyroidism and laryngeal paralysis is not clear, and it may just be a concurrent condition rather than a cause of a laryngeal paralysis. I've never known a laryngeal paralysis to be cured by being put on thyroid supplementation. Same thing if you're suspecting myasthenia gravis, um, you know, well, it may want to do your acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So, radiographs. I tend to do the chest as well as the neck because we're looking for masses. So we're looking for if there's any other causes of the dyspnea, say a lung lobe torsion. And we're looking to see if we can find the cause of a laryngeal paralysis, like a mass in the neck or mass in the chest. And as well as concurrent pathology. So things like aspiration pneumonia or uh, megaesophagus. You can see the, the arrows pointing to the significantly dilated esophagus. Now, when I, when I graduated many, many years ago, we were always taught to delay surgery if there was aspiration pneumonia because it increased complications. However, recent studies have shown that that may not actually necessarily be true and having aspiration pneumonia pre-op was not necessarily a risk factor for developing more complications. And I think if these guys are in severe respiratory distress because of the upper airway, not the low airway, then surgery is still, still indicated. So to make a definitive diagnosis, you actually have to look at the uh, larynx under a light plane of, of anesthesia. If these guys are too, too asleep, uh, the, the arytenoids would look paralyzed anyway, okay? Um, I get my, uh, my assistants to actually position these guys, and once again, a sternal recumbency facing me directly <coughs> in a, like a position where you're going to put an ET tube down. Um, so normally what should happen is during inspiration, the arytenoids should abduct and during expiration, they should passively relax and there should always be a gap in, in the middle, okay? Now what can happen in laryngeal, what happens in laryngeal paralysis is that these do not abduct um, during inspiration um, and actually they can actually stay as they are or they can actually completely collapse in the midline. 
one thing you need to be aware of is paradoxical movement. So it can sometimes see that um, the air or the larynx or the arytenoids are opening and closing with a dog breathing. However, it's paradoxical. So when they're inspiring, they're closing, and when they're expiring, they're opening. So what I always do is get one of my assistants to tell me when that dog's breathing in and breathing out so I can tell, because it can look normal if, you, if you're confusing with paradoxical movement. The arytenoids also tend to be quite edematous and erythematous as well. So that's a giveaway sign. So this is a dog we did mm, last week, Tara, with Labradoodle, 12 years. I'm afraid the video is a little bit fuzzy, but it's the best I can get. But what I want to try and show you is the fact that you can see here is the arytenoids. They're not moving at all. You can possibly at one stage see a little bit of a fluttering of the left. Oh. You can see they're just moving, and you can hear the dog breathing. And you can almost just see the left one, the one over here, just Sorry. fluttering a little bit. Sorry. Once again, I said to people, I'm videoing, don't talk. So she was a classic case. Um, so you tell me in and out. You mm. can see there's still nothing, and when I, I start to say in and out, mm. and you can see. So you tell me in and out. Mm. 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 Okay, perfect. So absolutely nothing, and neither side is doing anything. So that to me was concrete evidence. So how do we manage these guys? Um, <coughs> Once again, they can present as an emergency uh, with, with respiratory cre um, crisis, um, and same as the BOAS. Trigger factors are exactly the same, and the initial management is exactly the same, so I'm not gonna go through that again. So if we look at specific management of laryngeal paralysis for the last few minutes, so you can um, try and treat these conservatively. Now, there's a few indications, so normally if the signs are, are pretty mild, or if you feel that there's a conscious indication to, the, uh, to a GA. And really some people just, you know, they're 14, 15 year old Labradors just don't want to put them through surgery. And if that's the case, that's fine, but you know, consider things like, you know, avoiding exercise during the heat, um, reducing um, any stress, and obviously if they are overweight, weight loss. But it is a progressive condition, so not only will their larynx progress, um, but also they tend to sort of end up with hind limb um, neurological issues as well. So once again, I'm a surgeon, so I think this is a surgical disease and it should have surgical management. Um, now, cricoarotenoid lateralization is by far the most tried and tested technique. There are other, are other techniques um, described, so the ventricular cordectomy and partial arotenoidectomy, the modified castellated laryngeal fissure and a permanent tracheostomy. I have never ever in my life needed to do any of those. Um, and the middle two are actually pretty complicated with severe um, complications and it's just not worth trying. So how I do a unilateral cricoarotenoid lateralization. Bear in mind this is a bilateral disease, but actually you only need to do it unilaterally because the success rate is over 90% and the complication rate is much less if you do it unilaterally compared to bilaterally. Um, most right-handed surgeons do this uh, as a left lateral approach, um, purely for the fact it's easier to get the suture around the cricoid. Um, and this is how I tend to position my dog. So I tend to obviously have them in right lateral, head and neck slightly extended, front legs pulled slightly back, and either a sandbag or um, a towel or something just underneath the larynx. It just brings the larynx up to the, the skin surface and makes it a lot easier to get to. So this is a tried and tested technique. However, the last few years, there's been a few modifications to the technique that um, have shown to actually cause less distortion of the larynx um, and then obviously less aspiration pneumonia. So I'm gonna probably highlight those a little bit for you. So most people do a lateral approach. I have known some people describe or do a ventral approach. Um, but basically you want to incise just underneath the, the jugular vein and a few centimetres caudal to the mandible and go through the subcutaneous tissue as well. And sometimes there can be a lot of fat there. You should be able to palpate the thyroid cartilage. You should be able to feel the dorsal ridge of the thyroid. 
and then when you can hook your fingers over that you want to rotate that laterally and what you're trying to do is expose the pharyngeus muscle remember the muscle that goes over the pharynx which you don't want to damage too much and you want to incise it along the dorsal edge of the thyroid cartilage now one of the modifications is um, in a paper called von fell in 2014 that basically they described um, only incising a quarter of the quicker pharyngeus muscle instead of a whole thing um, and mainly the caudal aspect. This gives you enough room to put your suture in without actually causing significant damage to the muscle. Okay, so when you incise that muscle, you can see it's cut there, you then need to pull your thyroid cartilage back. You can either use a sen retractor or um, some people to put a stay suture in there. So the next modification is that um, the cricothyroid junction should not be um, cut or um, disarticulated because it will destabilize the larynx. So remember the cricothyroid is this one. If you just retract the thyroid cartilage, you get enough for you. You do not need to damage that joint, okay? And in fact, a cadaver study in 2015 showed that if you disarticulate that, you're going to end up with more distortion of a laryngeal opening and hence a lack of a seal when the epiglottis uh, covers the larynx during swallowing and therefore aspiration pneumonia. So when you've retracted your, your thyroid cartilage laterally, you then want to be able to feel um, the cricoarotenoid junction. But you should be able to feel that quite easily. So it sort of sits in the middle of the length of the thyroid cartilage um, and you need to expose that um, and bear in mind you will get a little bit of the dorsal arotenoid muscle attached to it. This muscle is normally atrophied, um, sometimes there's a little bit of a muscle but mostly it's a fibrous strand. And what you then want to do is you want to basically open up the cricoarotenoid junction. So as I said, this is an ovial junction, so I've got cartilage on both sides. And how I tend to do it is I take a pair of scissors and I go from caudal to cranial, and I'd literally just open the caudal part of that joint. You do not need to open the whole thing. You just need to be able to get a suture through the muscular process properly, okay? Um, so you then need to put your suture. Um, so the aim of a suture is to go through the caudal dorsal aspect of the cricoid, through to the muscular process of the arotenoid. Most people tend to use 2 proline. Um, you can use one or two sutures. I tend to use two. I think it's a bit of a safety net for me. And the result is that it will not only uh, pull this uh, arotenoid cordially, it will also pull it slightly laterally. There is a variation to this, um, and that's called a thyroarotenoid suture. Um, so this is a lot easier, uh, it's a lot quicker. Uh, and basically what you do is put a suture through the muscular process and the caudal dorsal aspect of the thyroid. The problem with this is it doesn't tend to open the um, laryngeal inlet as much. However, clinically, and uh, it's, not been sh it's shown not to make any difference at all. So if you're struggling to feel your anatomy or it's a very fat dog and you just can't get around the cricoid, you can certainly do the thyroarotenoid suture. So big question is how much tension do you put on it? How long is a piece of string? It's a difficult one to say. Bear in mind that the resistance to the airflow is inversely proportional to the radius to the power of four. So you don't need to open this airway particularly a lot to get an improvement in the airflow. Obviously, if you open it too much, you're going to end up with aspiration pneumonia. If you don't open it enough, you can end up with a dog which has still got laryngeal paralysis. And I think a lot of it just comes with a bit of experience. Um, if, you re if you read the literature, very helpful conclusions or guidelines are, well, the first one I um, found was tie without overabduction and caudal displacement of the arytenoids. How to do that? The other one was, um, so the arytenoids in the normal position arrest and prevent inward displacement during inspiration. The way I try and do this is by if you limit the disarticulation of the uh, quicker fire junction as in don't disarticulate it and if you place your suture correctly it should automatically open this airway enough but not too much. When you're putting your suture through a dorsal caudal aspect of a cricoid you want to come just a couple of millimeters behind where the cricoarotenoid junction is not come straight through there over there okay and then that should get uh, the adequate displacement that you're looking for. Closure is fairly simple. You want to obviously close your thyropharyngeus muscle, subcutaneous and skin. Um, and then before you wake the dog up, you need to check there's adequate abduction of the arotenoids before recovery. So this is obviously how the left um, 
left a quicker arabinoid lateralization and to examine this properly you should remove the ET tube and then to wake the dog up just put a smaller one back in. Um, and the, the remit lotus or the entrance to the to larynx should sort of be not much larger than the ET tube that you originally had in. So complications. Um, if you read the literature, there's a massive uh, rate of complications up to 60% and even higher if you do this bilaterally. Um, seroma and hematoma are uh, inevitable, um, but probably the most serious complication is aspiration pneumonia, which is why, what we're trying to do to prevent this from happening. And that can occur up to 20% of, of patients. Um, and bilateral, as you can see, 90% of them will end up with aspiration pneumonia at some stage. There's been two papers in 2016 that have actually looked at the risk factors. So one said that post-operative post megaesophagus, i.e. poor esophageal motility, and opioids are risk factors for developing aspiration pneumonia. In my, my point, you can't avoid giving opioids to these dogs. You need to give them pain relief. Um, and uh, the interesting thing to note is that actually the use of metoclopamide perioperatively doesn't make any, any difference in these guys. I always warn her they can have a persistent cough or gag. Um, and uh, the strider is often there and almost a third of patients that still have some degree of strider. The suture or the, the surgical technique can fail and that's either failed by the suture breaking or the cartilage fracturing. And laryngeal webbing is reported to be a complication but that's normally if you're actually um, surgically excising the arytenoids. So as I said to you earlier, it's 90% success in these guys, um, despite the frequent complications. Um, small breeds don't seem to do so well. Um, dogs less than 10 kilograms tend to have an increase of recurrence, and the majority of those dogs do actually need the surgery performed on, on the other side. So the only thing I want to sort of highlight in the post-operative care part is the feeding regime. So um, once again, um, I'm a bit old school and we were always taught to feed these guys meatballs um, and feed them from a height. But actually the most recent literature has actually said that the feeding, re feeding regime actually makes no difference to the, the possibility of post-operative aspiration pneumonia. So I just now feed these guys normally. So in conclusion, Remember, laryngeal paralysis is part of a generalized neuropathy. Look for those other neurological conditions as it may affect your prognosis. Doing a more less invasive unilateral quicker arytenoid lateralization is definitely the treatment of choice. And despite the numerous complications done well, they tend to have a favorable prognosis. Thank you.